Christ. Amen. First Corinthians chapter 9. If you'll join me in reading today verses 24 through verse 27. First Corinthians chapter 9. Verses 24 through 27. As always, I read from the King James text. Know ye not that they which run in a race run all, but one receiveth the prize. So run that ye might obtain. And every man that striveth for the mastery is temperate in all things. Now they do it to obtain a corruptible crown, but we an incorruptible. I therefore so run, not as uncertainly, so fight I, not as one that beateth the air, but I keep, my, un, I keep under my body and bring it into subjection, lest that by any means, when I have preached to others, I myself should be a castaway. Amen. I want to talk to us for a while today on the topic, Go for the Gold. If you'll bow your heads with me one more moment. Father, we love you. Jesus, we thank you, Lord, for this opportunity to be in the house of God. We love the Word of God. It is the breath of life. It is the bread of life for believers. We feast upon the truths and the wisdom of these pages. But for the Word of God to hold any value, it must be preached. For the Word of God declares, Faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the Word of God. But for even the preached Word, to inspire faith and to lift us up to a new place in you. It must be anointed of the Holy Ghost. The presence and power of God must rest upon the word as it is preached. That the hearer might be convinced not by the speaker, but by the spirit of a living God. That that which they hear is indeed factual and true and it is in keeping with the perfect word of our God. Master anoint today the ear of every hearer. Help us to receive the word of God with gladness that it might benefit our soul and bring forth fruit in our lives unto righteousness before you. For we ask it in none other name than Jesus name. Amen. Praise God and amen. You know, I was talking to the Lord this week and I said, Lord, since I've been doing the type of ministry that I have been doing, uh, you have me preaching in such an unusual and a different vein that I'm accustomed to preaching in. I, I do a lot of preaching these days. Um, it's very instructional, it is very doctrinal, but it, I, I don't quite know how to explain it. But I thought, you know, a lot of people in our world today, especially those who call themselves Christians, they want a preacher who gets up and preaches them, either somebody who gets up and preaches them happy. In other words, somebody who gets up and preaches all the high notes, so they can shout and dance about it for a while. Or they want somebody who gets up and preaches, uh, what do I need to do to be rich? What do I need to do to be successful? What do I need to do uh, to do better in this life than I've done? And that is what they seek. And a lot of your major preachers on television and online these days, that is the nature of the message they preach. Because frankly, I'm going to say it the way I believe it, because they're preaching for an audience rather than preaching for the Lord. I can't do that because frankly, I don't choose my subject matter. I don't decide what I'm going to preach on. 
I seek the face of God. And I say, Lord, give me a word for your people. And the word that he's given me over these many years has been rather different and unique and unusual. I spend more time trying to instruct the people of God on how to be the best believer you can be. I spend more time encouraging God's people to hold on to their faith in spite of every obstacle and everything that might come against it. And that isn't what T.D. Jakes preaches. Oh, I said it. That isn't what Rod Parsley preaches. That isn't what a lot of these TV preachers, oh no, they're too busy preaching about, oh, how you can be blessed, how you can have more, how you can see more and live more and be more. And I said, Lord, why is it you've given me this, this nature of, of message that you give me? And he come back to me with the, <laughs> the simplest answer. He said, because while they're preaching, this is how you can be more blessed. This is how you can have more. This is how you can experience more in life. He said, the truth of the matter is they're saying this is how you can. But the answers they're giving are not accurate. He said, what you're doing is you're not saying this is how you can have more. This is how you can receive more. This is how you can be more blessed. He said, but the message you're preaching will accomplish exactly that end. I said, huh, interesting. He said, the word of God promises. Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these things shall be added up to you. He said, you're preaching the kingdom of God and his righteousness. All the things being added are part of the package. The only difference is you're not using that language. You're not using that uh, carrot, as it were, on a stick in order to lure people in. No, no, no. You're not telling them, oh, I'm preaching this so that you can have this carrot. He said, no, you're just preaching it because that's what I want you to preach. He said, but the carrot will come. The people who live what we preach around here will experience blessing. They'll experience the favor of God and God. I know firsthand that's the truth. Tommy and I can tell you over the last 22 years we've been together, I can tell you, we have seen God come through for us so many times, it's not even funny. We've seen miracle after miracle after miracle. We've seen the Lord come through. We have been blessed and blessed and blessed and blessed and blessed. And yet I'm not up here preaching a prosperity message. I'm not up here preaching the prosperity gospel. No, I'm just preaching what we need to do as believers because that's what God wants preachers to preach as children of God today we have been called to train for and participate in a race we're like children who train for participation in the Olympics Years ago, I once knew somebody who was an Olympic uh, trainee in the realm of figure skating, and he trained like a lunatic, you know, spent a lot of hours, a lot of time training so that he could at least uh, try to earn a place on the American figure skating team. So far as I know, I don't think he ever made it, but he sure did try. We do this in order that we might be the best person we can be and so that we might have the best possible testimony that we can have before a lost and dying world. That's why we've been called to train and participate in a race so we can be the best person we can be. 
so we can have the best testimony we can have. We are called, listen carefully, believer, to shoot for the stars so that we might actually be able to land on the moon. <laughs> any, any trainer, anybody who knows anything about sports, anybody who knows anything about training, understands that if you are going to be able to be the best that you can possibly be, then you have to have the highest possible aspiration. You've got to set your goal way, 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 way up here somewhere. Because in pursuit of this goal, you might reach here. But you know what? Here might break every world record there is. Here might be better than anybody else on planet Earth. Hello now. Oh, but you don't want to aim for here because if you aim for here, you're only going to get to here. So therefore, a trainer, a coach, a teacher, an instructor is always going to have you aiming for this bar way up here. Am I telling the truth? Got news for you today, children. God is no different. The Lord understands human nature. He knows how we work. He knows how we think. He knows that if we're going to reach a, a point of excellence, we have to aim toward perfection. Now, we'll never get to perfection, but we'll never get to excellence if we're only aiming toward being good. Oh my goodness, did you hear what I said today? Mm -hmm. In our primary text today, the Apostle Paul said that, uh, Know ye not that they which run in a race run all, but one receiveth the prize. So run that ye may obtain. The word obtain that is used here in the Greek is a word, katalambano, uh, to lay hold of as to make one's own or to obtain, to attain to, to take into oneself, to seize upon or to take possession. Oh, I'm telling you, I'm not running this race so that I can lose it. I'm not running this race so I can get tired a few feet from the finish line and stop running. I'm not running this race today so that I can get so far and then quit. No, I'm running this race with every intention in the world of finishing. Hallelujah. Amen. Glory to God. I'm connected on Facebook with people that I love. I, I love them more than anything in this world. People I grew up with, people that I knew in church as a kid. And I adore these people. They were part of my life, you know, when I was young and there was so much confusion in my head and there was so much going on in my family and in my home. And dear God, you know, some of these people were part of the church I grew up in, and the church I grew up in was one of the best things in my life, in my youth. It was a place of refuge for me. It's where I found peace and joy and power and strength to keep going because living with a narcissist father and the situation that we were in, I'm telling you, it was tough every single day. It was tough. And Tommy, I grew up with some real sweet people, and I love them to death. But I have been so disappointed over the years to see how many of the people I grew up with don't even, if I judge by what I see on Facebook, I'm not sure they're even in church anymore. I'm not even sure they're trying to live for God anymore. I'm not sure they're even trying to be a Christian anymore. And I look and I say, Lord, here I am, the gay boy, 
that everybody wants to condemn and everybody wants to criticize and everybody wants to send to hell and everybody wants to tell you can't be a Christian and be who you are and yet I'm the only one who's still in church at least trying. All these friends of mine, straight as an arrow, got husbands, got wives, got kids. Oh, they're perfect. They're perfect according to a fundamentalist evangelical standard anyway. And yet, it looks to me like they just quit trying altogether. Oh, honey, I'm here to tell you that I didn't start this race with any intention of stopping until I hit the victory line. Glory to God. I plan on going all the way through. I plan on being there. Glory. When they crown him king. Hallelujah. Oh, I'm going to hit the finish line. I'm going to see them wave the checkered flag. Hallelujah. Oh! I'm running that I might obtain glory to God the word of God goes on to tell us in every man that striveth for the mastery master what does they mean by mastery you ever heard the term a master plumber or a master electrician or a master carpenter. If you're a master carpenter, a master plumber, a master electrician, that means that you have mastered that profession. That means that you have hit the highest level of knowledge and training and competency in that given field. Got a lot of Christians, they're happy to be Christians, but they don't want to master Christianity. Mm. Oh my goodness, do you hear me now? Oh God help me never to be satisfied with just being a believer. Let me always have that goal in mind. I want to finish this race, but like I preached last Sunday or the Sunday before, but I want to finish it further ahead than I was when I started. Amen. I don't want to cross the finish line the same person I was when I began my journey with the Lord. I don't want to get to heaven the same person I was when I first believed and obeyed this gospel. I want to have mastered Christianity. I want to have learned to live it. Oh, I'm going to tell you, there have been believers in my life. There have been people in my life. I talk about them all the time that I can honestly say to you, I believe with all my heart that they were master Christians. My God, they weren't just grim. I talked about it a little while ago. My little great-grandma, <laughs> Mary. <sighs> that lady could love anybody. Didn't matter what condition your life was in. Didn't matter how messed up you were. Didn't matter how many struggles and troubles you had. My little grandma could love you. She never met anybody she hated. She never met anybody she disliked. She never had one word for me negative when I came out in 1989. Never said one single word to me that was hurtful. Never said one word to me that was negative. My grandmother, her daughter, oh my, my bless her heart. She couldn't help herself. She just had to say things. And some of the junk that would come out of her mouth would be so hurtful. It was, it was painful, some of the garbage she would say. But she didn't even think about it, you know. She didn't even care that she was speaking to her grandson and saying things that were deeply hurtful and painful and nasty and frankly unnecessary. Not my great grandma. Brother and sister Gillum. Man, I'm going to tell you if I ever saw master Christians in my life, brother and sister Gillum were master Christians. I, I just, I wish to heavens I had the opportunity to take every single one of you and introduce you to these people because if you had had a chance just to meet them, 
That's all they would have taken. You would have loved them right from the starting line. I told Tommy after we had our ceremony back in 2015, we took a trip to Cape Cod for honeymoon, as it were. And I told Tommy, I said, I know a lot of people on their honeymoons aren't going to visit family and stuff. I said, but that's not the way we do things in my family. I said, if I go somewhere where there's family, then I've got to go see my family. I have to. I said, that's just the way it works in our family. I said, uh, that's just how we, I said, that's part of the fun for me of a vacation. That's part of the, it is. That's part of the joy of being able to take a vacation and go somewhere that I don't get to go very often. I get to see loved ones that I don't see frequently. And so I told him, I said, I've got some cousins on the Cape. Their names are Bobby and Phyllis Dutra. And I said, I'm going to tell you now, Tommy, you're going to meet these people and you're going to love them. I said, you're going to love them because they are just the sweetest, kindest, most hospitable, oh my goodness, the most giving people you ever want to meet in your life. I said, they have always been so wonderful. Our family viewed them as kind of celebrities. <laughs> when they would come to Connecticut to visit, I mean, every member of my mother's family would come to my grandparents' house to see Bobby and Phyllis. Everybody would come. Everybody would come. Because th th there was something about them that was so positive and, and so joyful and so good and so sweet and so nice. And they just earned such a high place of respect and appreciation in our family. And then every time somebody in the family would go to Cape Cod we got to go by and see Bobby and Phyllis and then of course we had other family there too, Aunt Alice and my cousin Pee Wee who I love she's a crack up boy I'll tell you, you want, you want somebody to have you laughing your fool head off, Pee Wee knows how to make you laugh and Bobby is her brother and Phyllis is her sister-in-law but boy I'm going to tell you something I told Tommy I said you meet these people you're going to love them we went to the Cape. We went by Bobby and Phyllis's house. We sat down in their living room. We started talking. And when we left, I said to Tommy, I said, now didn't I tell you the minute you met them, you were going to love them? And Tommy said, boy, you weren't kidding. He said, Bobby started talking to me. He said, and from minute one, it was like he had no problem with me. He had no problem with any issues uh, in our lives and who we were and what we were. He said, he just started talking. He said, I never felt so comfortable. I never felt so welcome. I never felt so at home with with somebody as I did with Bobby. He said he just hit right off the starting line. And of course Phyllis as well. I said I told you so. Well I'm here to tell you if brother and sister Gillum weren't already shouting around the throne I'd be able to introduce them to you and I'm going to tell you something. Within five minutes you'd be in love with them. Because the love of God just oozed out of their pores. They didn't have that old judgmental, negative, critical, nasty spirit that so many who call themselves Christians today had. No, they mastered Christianity. Tommy had the opportunity to meet brother and sister King, Dewey King and his wife from Riverside Church of God, Master Christians. Oh, I'm going to tell you, master Christians, people who live this thing like few of us can live it. I say, Lord, I'd love to be like Brother Sister King. I'd love to, one day, hopefully, maybe by the time I'm 90, I might learn how to get to where they were at. Just love and and kindness and sweetness about them. They lived Christianity like nobody I've ever seen live Christianity. I grew up in a church full of people that honestly I believe were master Christians. And I hate to say this, 
I really do. But my family was not in that number. No, most of the people in my family, they, they were judgmental and critical and they talk about you behind your back and they had all kinds to say and you know, and uh, that wasn't Brother Gillum, that wasn't Sister Gillum, that wasn't Brother and Sister King, you know, that wasn't uh, the master Christians that I've known. But there were people in the church equipping the old bars. Some more kings. There's something about that name king that just seems to put you at the top of God's list. Growing up as a kid, we had two king brothers, Harold King and Richard King and their wives. Oh, I'm going to tell you something. Those were people, Tommy, that, dear God, you just, you just stood in their presence and you could feel the love of God. You could feel His kindness. You could feel His grace. Paul said, every man that striveth for the mastery. Not everybody running the race today is striving for the mastery. But that's where we ought to be. Because that's setting the bar way up here somewhere. If you strive for the mastery, you may achieve excellence. You may go beyond merely doing a good job. <laughs> I'm going to tell you, I, I'm not going to stand here and lie to you. I'm not even sure half the time if I do a good job of living this thing. I don't feel like I do a lot of times. I try. Not sure I even do a good job. But Lord knows in my heart, I keep saying, Lord, one of the reasons I pray God give us the church is because the church helps you folks to achieve the mastery. There's a reason why God gave us the church. There's a reason why we are called to operate as a body of believers. We encourage one another. We inspire one another. We uplift one another. We pray for one another. We support one another. And as we do that, we're all being elevated. We're all being pushed up a notch higher and a notch higher. It helps to encourage us to do better and to act better and to live better and to be a better testimony. Not having a church for 30 years has taken its toll on me. I'm going to tell you right now. I'm not going to lie to you. I'm not going to stand here and fit to you. It has taken its toll on me. I have never been so discouraged and despondent and depressed and disgusted in my life as I have been the last 20 years. 25 years because I need a church. I need a church. I need people that want to pray with me. I need people that want to worship with me. I want to, I need people that love the Lord as much as I love the Lord so we can talk and encourage one another and inspire one another. I want one day by the help and grace of God I'd love to attain the mastery. I'd love to be able to to be like Brother Gillum, Sister Gillum, Brother King, Sister King, Harold King, Richard King. The unbelieving world today lives a life without purpose or direction. How many times have you heard somebody say, I just don't know what my purpose is. You know, I, I just don't know. I, you know, I live my life. I do what I do, but I don't know why. <laughs> I don't know where I'm going. I don't know what I'm doing. I don't know why I'm doing it. One of the most wonderful things that living for the Lord does, it gives us purpose. It gives us direction. We are by reason of our born again life in Christ called to better ourselves, to be better, to do better. Having been gloriously saved by our great creator, who became our Savior, we demonstrate our appreciation for that salvation by preparing ourselves to one day be perfected. See, I, I have my goal way up here. Now, I know I'm not going to reach that goal till after the rapture. 
But that doesn't mean that I can't help myself get a whole lot closer to it than I was as an unbeliever. That doesn't mean I can't get a whole lot closer than I was as a sinner needing to be saved by grace. No, in appreciation for what God has done for me, I can at least get closer to that place. So when the rapture comes, I don't need quite as much of an overhaul as I might have needed a few years back. Hallelujah. Revelation 1, 4 through 6, listen. The word of God said, John, to the seven churches which are in Asia, grace be unto you and peace from him which is and which was and which is to come and from the seven spirits which are before his throne and from Jesus Christ who is the faithful witness and the first begotten of the dead and the prince of the kings of the earth unto him that loved us and washed us from our sins in his own blood listen and hath made us kings and priests unto God and his father to him be glory and dominion forever and ever in Revelation 5 verses 9 and 10 the word of the Lord declares and they sung a new song saying thou art worthy to take the book and to open the seals thereof for thou wast slain and hast redeemed us to God by thy blood out of every kindred and tongue and people and nation and has made us unto our God kings and priests and we shall reign on the earth we don't strive for the mastery we don't strive to be better to do better to live better in this life in order to earn heaven or to deserve eternal life we have secured those prizes by believing and obeying the gospel. He hath made us kings and priests. Did you hear those first four words? He hath made us. Hallelujah. Not we have made ourselves. Oh, glory to God. Oh, glory. Oh my God, when we finally hit that place of perfection, it's not because we did it ourselves. That's it's right. because He has made us yes. kings and priests. Not we have become kings and priests. Mm -hmm. But we cannot live in the palace of a king and continue to behave as the filthy street urchins that we once were. No, he has graciously adopted us into his family. And by doing so, he has made us royalty. Hallelujah. It is now our obligation, listen, to live our gratitude by making our father the king of kings proud. Every day we strive to be more like him, knowing that one day we too shall reign as a king and a priest. There's a reason Jesus is called the king of kings. And it is not because he is a king over Queen Elizabeth and King Charles. No, hallelujah. It's because he is a king who has made kings. Hallelujah. And he is the king of kings. Glory to God. He not only adopted us and made us part of his family, but he made us royalty. But he didn't make us into a bunch of princes and princesses. He made us into kings. <coughs> Don't you know everybody that runs in the race doesn't win the prize. One receives the prize. Folks, Jesus already won the prize. You're not winning. Uh, excuse me. You're not running to win the prize. Right. You're running to finish. Right. 
because Jesus stands at the finish line and says, if you will run to finish, if you will strive for the mastery, if you will train and you will do your best at becoming better with every passing day, when you reach the finish line, I'm going to share my prize with you. Oh, hallelujah. You don't see very many who win races who do that, do you? No, they get up on the podium and they hold their medal against their chest with great pride because they're the winner. But Jesus says, no, I won for all of humanity that will believe and obey this gospel. I didn't do this for myself. I didn't run this race for myself. I ran it for you. Glory to God. Hallelujah. Oh, my Lord, have mercy. In Luke 17, 11 through 19, and it came to pass as he went to Jerusalem that he passed through the midst of Samaria and Galilee. And as he entered into a certain village, there met him ten men that were lepers, which stood afar off. And they lifted up their voices and said, Jesus, Master, have mercy on us. And when he saw them, he said unto them, Go, show yourselves unto the priests. And it came to pass that as they went, they were cleansed. And one of them, when he saw that he was healed, turned back and with a loud voice glorified God. And fell down on his face at his, meaning Jesus' feet, giving him thanks. And he was a Samaritan. And Jesus answering said, were there not ten cleansed? But where are the nine? There are not found that return to give glory to God. Save this stranger, this foreigner. And he said unto him, Arise, go thy way. Thy faith hath made thee whole. Leprosy has always been representative of sin. A hopeless condition, having no cure outside of divine intervention in biblical days. Even as Moses was given the ability to demonstrate a miraculous sign by reaching into the breast of his cloak and revealing a leprous hand, even so we always have within us the sinful nature hidden beneath the cloak of Christ who is our salvation and our righteousness. But after we have been cleansed and made whole by the precious blood of Christ, it is incumbent upon us, listen, to make our way back and express our gratitude and our appreciation. Oh, hallelujah. Say, preacher, what's the difference between your church and so many churches in America today? I'll tell you the difference in a nutshell. They preach you got to do this, 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 and this if you're going to make heaven. We preach if you appreciate what God has done for you, if you appreciate the born again experience, if you appreciate the baptism of the Holy Ghost, if you appreciate being washed in the blood, if you appreciate the presence of God in your life, then you will do this, 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 and this. Not because you're trying to earn heaven, but because you're grateful. That's right. It's all about perspective. Mm -hmm. It's all about how you approach things. Mm -hmm. I'm not trying to earn heaven. I don't try to live a good life. I don't try to be the best believer I can be because I'm trying to earn heaven. Honey, no, that's been taken care of. I'm doing it now because the presence of God in my life, the born again experience, the infilling of the Holy Ghost, all of these things are so precious to me that I can't help 
I can't help like Tim Hill's old song says, I can't help but I just came back to cry holy. I just came back to give praise. Hallelujah. Oh, I want to tell you today, my friend, in Galatians 3.27, for as many of you as have been baptized into Christ have put on Christ. He is our righteousness. He is our holiness. He is what God sees when the Lord looks upon us. He sees that cloak of Christ. But like Moses, all we have to do is put our hand inside that cloak and we will expose that inside there is yet leprosy. There is yet sin. It will be there till Jesus comes. And thank God that day no longer will we need a cloak because we will now become uh, as he is, the word of God promises. Our nature will become his nature. His nature will become our nature. We'll no longer need a cloak of righteousness for we shall become the righteousness of God. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. In Luke chapter 7, verse 47, Wherefore I say unto thee, Her sins which are many are forgiven, for she loved much, but to whom little is forgiven, the same loveth little. Oh, why do I try so hard to live this? Why do I strive for the mastery? Because God sure forgave an awful lot for me. One thing that every believer ought to do is remember where they come from. It's, it's a good thing to forget the past. It's a good thing to move beyond the past. But it's also a good thing to never forget where you came from. Yeah. It'll keep you humble. It'll keep you centered. Right. It'll keep you from making a fool out of yourself. It'll keep you from looking upon others with a judgmental eye or a condemnatory stare. If you remember where God brought you from. In Matthew 18, we read a parable of a king who took account of his servants. One servant owed him 10,000 talents. And in an act of grace, the king forgave him that debt. When that same servant then found a fellow servant, which owed him 100 pence, he choked and threatened the man demanding repayment. Now to put this story into perspective for you, the servant had been forgiven by the king for a debt that would almost be basically about $10,000. Yet when he came upon a man, listen to this, who owed him $1.00. He felt justified in becoming violent and threatening. Mm -hmm. Can you imagine? The servant was not ordered by the king to forgive the debts of those who owed him. Remember, the king did not order the servant to forgive others' debts, yet... It was expected that he would do so. Why? Out of sheer gratitude for the great relief he had been given by the king who had forgiven his own debt. You see, folks, it's not about God standing over us demanding that we do this or we do that or we lit this or we do No, no, no. He's not making demands. But at the same time, there is an expectation that you're going to strive to live right. There's an expectation that you're going to try to do better and live better and be better. Why? Because you're grateful. After everything God's done for you, how foolish would it be after everything God done, God's done for you to just go out and act as though he had done nothing in your life at all? In Matthew chapter 22, verse 4, excuse me, I'm sorry. The children of God are called to excellence. We're not called to do good or simply to be good. 
but to rise up to excellence. We are called to love, but not just love our friends, our families, those who love us. No, we're called even to love our enemies. We're called to forgive those who might owe us as an expression of gratitude for having been forgiven by God. Many people want to believe that they can achieve eternal life and make heaven their eternal home. Simply listen to me now. By being good. How many times have you heard somebody say that? Oh, I believe if you, if you live a good life, if you're a good person, if you're good, if you're good, if you're good, you can make heaven. Ah, uh, wrong. God hasn't called us to goodness. He's called us to excellence. Hallelujah. Oh my God, we're running in a race, honey. If you're going to run in a race, if you're going to finish the race, never mind when. If you're going to finish the race, you've got to train. I lived in New York City for 10 years. I saw people run in the New York City Marathon. I'm going to tell you something, sweetie. I couldn't have run that marathon. There's no way in the world I could have run that marathon. There's no way in the world I could. No, because everybody that runs in that marathon runs. Every one of the people that run in that marathon trains. Every one of them puts effort in so that they can at least finish that race and they can tell others, I ran in the New York City Marathon. And you know what? Nobody asked them, did you win? Because <laughs> if they won, you'd know they won. No, some guy from Africa who's skinny as a rail and, and moves like a cheetah, he won. But you know what? There's still a lot of prestige. There's still a lot of pride just in the fact you ran mm -hmm. and finished. Oh, my goodness. I couldn't do it. Lord, I'd get off the finish line, probably be 50 yards down the road, and they'd have to call an ambulance. <laughs> <coughs> Excuse me. But the Lord has not called us simply today to be good, but rather to pursue excellence, to go for the gold. We set ourselves apart from this world by being Olympians in training. We may not be Olympians, but we are Olympians in training. My friend Mark, who was training, for the Olympics as a, a figure skater. I will tell you something, that boy, he, he was set apart from every other skater because other skaters skate, but they're not training for the Olympics. Do you hear what I'm telling you now? Therefore, he was quite a bit more skillful than most, am I telling the truth now? Most people could never say, I'm training for the Olympics, but he could. As a child of God, I'm not perfect, but I'm training for the Olympics. Hallelujah. I know one day I'm going to be an Olympian. One day I'm going to stand before God. I'm going to share in the reward that Jesus Christ has won. But I can only do so if I train so that I can not only start this race, but so that I can finish it. We seek to be worthy to compete in the Olympics. Now not everybody that trains is going to be chosen to participate in the games as a representative for their nation. But in Matthew twenty two fourteen, the word of God declares, for many are called, but few are chosen. Lastly, today, I'm closing up, I promise. In Matthew 22, we read a parable that speaks to one's efforts to demonstrate gratitude in response to a generous invitation. No matter our station in life or our income, we can at the very least wash our face and clean ourselves and wash our hair and press our finest garments so that we might at least appear appreciative for having been invited to a wedding mm -hmm. right. rather than show up ragtag and sloppy as though we had just come from work 
or just come from a workout suggesting that that invitation merited little or no effort on our part at all. You ever been to a wedding and saw people standing there in jeans and t-shirts and thought to yourself, boy, how disrespectful, how, you know, they couldn't at least put on a button-up shirt. You know, they couldn't do something. I, I mean, hey, you don't have to wear a tuxedo. You don't have to have some big expensive wardrobe. But at least put on the best you got for the love of Pete. But see, that's how a lot of Christians today are living. Look at the way they, they appear. But we got preachers today preaching in pulpits wearing shorts and flip-flops. Because after all, God is cool. God is funky. Woohoo! Yes, and you are showing him every ounce of disrespect you can. Demonstrating that the house of God and the presence of God don't merit your putting any effort in whatsoever. I can't do that. I'm sorry. I come from old school. When I come to the house of God, I believe the presence of God is here. Where two or three are gathered together in my name, Jesus said, there am I in the midst of them. I believe King Jesus is here. And if King Jesus is here, he deserves that I put some kind of effort. Amen, yes. So that I demonstrate to him respect and reverence and gratitude for the great salvation that he's brought into my life. We've been called to go for the gold. We have been called to pursue excellence so that we might at least live greatness. I may not be able to ice skate or ski or run like a gold medal Olympian, but by training for the Olympics, I will certainly be far more capable at these sports than the majority of people in our world, am I telling the truth? May we never be satisfied to sit on the sidelines as a spectator, but rather to fully engage as one who runs in the race. And we do not run simply to say that we ran, but we run to obtain, to finish. Christ our King has already attained the gold medal, but he has promised a crown and to share his win with all who will pursue excellence and run as if they go for the gold. Hallelujah. Amen. Amen. Praise God. Amen. If you'd stand with me this afternoon.